In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the concept of trade and working out how trade works and expanding on our principle that we introduced in the last video about how trade can actually make everyone better off. In that last video, we said in order to really make this work, we need to define trade. And to define trade, what we need to do is just essentially be that trade is any exchange of goods or services. In this sense here, then, trade is no different whether we're talking about interpersonal or international trade. This is a useful definition to use then, because then we can simplify the trade problem to an interpersonal scenario, something that we're more familiar with. International becomes abstract, international becomes politicized, interpersonal we can deal with interpersonal we're familiar with and we deal with every day of our life we said well what does it look like to live in a world without trade and we realized with that that in a world without trade something as simple as getting a pen something as simple as making yourself a peanut butter sandwich for lunch is exceedingly difficult all of those bits that you need to make that sandwich all of those bits you need to make that pen would be exceedingly difficult for you to source for you to put together for you to manufacture to the end product on your own it is only with trade that these products become easy it is only with trade that we overlook the complexity of these simple projects products rather wow to carry on then what is our plan for today well our plan for today we're going to start off taking a look at determining comparative advantage and determining the direction of trade so who trades, who exports, who imports, what is the determining factor that influences this. From here, we're going to move on to a trade situation where trade is occurring, and we're going to identify what is the willingness to pay. How much money would somebody be willing to pay in order to buy a good? And what is the willingness to accept? What would be the minimum price that you would accept in order to sell your good? Finally, we're going to take a look at what is known as the gains from trade, and that is how we can all actually be better off having trade in our lives. So let's jump over and start taking a look at our content for today. So for simplicity's sake, let's presume that we have both Alberta and Ontario, so two provinces here in Canada, and let's presume that we have between them, or rather in each one, we have 1,000 workers. So 1,000 laborers that we are able to utilize in our production process for each, in each of these provinces. Then let's suppose that we have the following costs of production in each province. So our units here, we have energy in terms of labor per megawatt hour. And in manufacturing, we have our units in terms of labor per unit of manufacturing. These here are our absolute costs then, right? These are how much scarce resource we need per unit of output that we are gonna be creating. And we have the costs in Alberta, we have our costs in Ontario. One of the big things that we'll notice is that if we take a look at Alberta, their costs, 0.1 workers per megawatt hour versus Ontario's 0.2 workers per megawatt hour, we see that Alberta is able to make megawatt hours using fewer inputs, fewer workers. That is, Alberta can produce energy cheaper. If we jump over to manufacturing, we see that Alberta is able to produce 0.5 units of manufacturing per worker, where Ontario needs 0.8 workers in order to make a unit of manufacturing. Again, we see that Alberta has a lower cost of production. In this case here, what we would say is that given this here, given that Alberta has altogether lower costs, we would say that Alberta has, let's write this down, this is a big term, Alberta has an absolute advantage. Let's uh, stretch this text box out so that it actually fits a bit nicer. There we go. Alberta has an absolute advantage, and that's just meaning that everything that they produce, they're able to produce it in absolute terms, cheaper than the other country, person, region, or in this case, Ontario. Turns out though, that these actual costs of production, how much of the scarce resource we use, this absolute advantage is not what determines trade. 
what determines directions of trade or whether or not we can have gains from trade is the comparative advantage. And that comparative advantage is actually the opportunity cost. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to update this little box and we're going to want to figure out what is the opportunity cost of producing energy? What is the opportunity cost of producing manufactured goods? And what is that opportunity cost in each region? The way we do this, very similar to what we were looking at in that last video, we're just now expanding it to two regions. So instead of just doing it once for the one, we're doing it twice once for each one. In this sense here, what we're going to do is we're going to create this production possibility frontier. We'll create one production possibility frontier for Alberta and one production possibility frontier for Ontario. Let's take a look at this. Let's start off over here and we'll have Alberta and over here we'll do Ontario. Just doing some short form for each one. Let's create the production possibility frontier. We don't have any direction whether energy should be on the horizontal or the vertical. I'm just going to put energy on the vertical because, well, because why not? So for Alberta, let's go and draw their PPF. We'll have our vertical here. We'll have our horizontal. And then similarly, same idea for Ontario. We'll have the vertical and we'll have the horizontal. Okay. In each case, we're going to be putting energy, that's in terms of megawatt hours on our vertical. So again, there's Ontario, we have energy and megawatt hours. And on the horizontal, we're going to be putting our manufacturing. And that's in terms of how many units of manufacturing we can make. And same thing over here and how many units we can make. Okay, from here though, well, we seem to be at a loss. What are we gonna do in order to get this production possibility frontier to be realized in each case? Well, keep in mind what we were wanting to do is we need to figure out how much Alberta could produce if they put all of their efforts into producing energy. Similarly, how much could they produce if they put all of their efforts into manufacturing? And the way we solve this is we take a look at their scarce resource. So in this case, the thousand workers are thousand laborers. And we say, okay, given this scarce resource, given the rate at which we use this scarce resource to create our output, how much of the output could we produce? So, okay, we have 1000 workers. And we have a cost here of 0 0.1 uh, workers per megawatt hours. And right, keep in mind, just like we talked about in that last video, if you're a little bit lost as to what to do with this, just start playing with it. Just start playing either multiply or divide these numbers to each other and follow through what happens with the units, right? So if we just play with this, let's, well, hey, just since I wrote it this way, let's just go like this. Boom. Let's just go 1,000 workers divided by 0.1 worker per megawatt hour. So, okay, as we work through that, 1,000 divided by 0.1, that's going to explode on us. That's going to give us 1,000 divided by 0.1 is going to be 10,000. So let's write that guy down there. So we have 10,000, but 10,000 what? Well, let's take a look at our units, right? Let's take a look at the units here and see what these work out to. So keep in mind, we have a number divided by a fraction. Sorry, not a number, we have a unit divided by a fraction. What we're gonna do is we're gonna just flip this fraction and multiply. So that is we will have labor times megawatt hour per laborer. And so what do we get? We get labor canceling out. All we are left with is megawatt hours. So that is if Alberta were to put all of their resources into producing energy, they could produce 10,000 megawatt hours. So let's put that on our axes here. We have 10,000. 
Okay. Similarly, we can do the same thing to work out their manufacturing. Let's go take a look at what their cost was here. Alberta had an opportunity cost to, sorry, not an opportunity cost, an absolute cost of that manufacturing of 0.5 workers per unit of manufactured. So, okay, similarly, we'll do the same thing. We'll jump back down here and we'll go and say 1,000 workers divided by 0 0.5 workers per unit. And that, that guy there, that's gonna give us, what does that work out to? That works out to 2,000. So we have 2,000 workers per unit per worker. And again, our laborer, our worker cancels each other out. And what we're left with is 2,000 units. So again, going back up to update that, we have, ah, let's keep the color the same for our graph here. We have 2,000 units of manufacturing able to be produced in this case. Connecting our two extremes, and we get our production possibility frontier for Alberta. Okay, that being done, we need to jump over. We'll do the same thing for Ontario. So that is, Ontario has a thousand workers in each case as well. They'll have their corresponding costs of production, and we'll get our corresponding updated maximum amounts we could produce of each one. So let's go take a look at that. Over in Ontario, 1,000 workers divided by, what was our cost? We had an absolute cost of 0.2 workers per megawatt hour. So 1,000 workers divided by 0 0.2 workers per megawatt hour. So 1,000 divided by 0 0.2 yields us 5,000. And I'm just going to cheat a little bit here. I know what these units work out to because we just did it right there. So that works out for us to be 5,000 megawatt hours. Jumping down to the next section here, we get much of the same idea. 1,000 workers. We have our cost of 0.8 units. So if we work that through, we will have yet again 1,000 workers divided by 0.8 workers per unit. And that will give us all together 1,000 divided by 0 0.8, 1,250 units of manufacturing. So let's, let's put all this updated information up on our graph for Ontario. We have maximum production here of 5,000 and over here of 1250. Together, connecting those two dots, we have our production possibility frontier. Oh, let me uh, get that a bit better here. We have right there, our production possibility frontier, connecting the two extreme points. Great. So we have the PPF for each region. But what we're trying to do, if we recall, what was the point of all this? We were trying to work out, instead of these absolute costs of production, we were trying to work out what the opportunity cost was of production. That is, in Alberta, what was the opportunity cost of producing another unit of energy, another megawatt hour of energy? In Alberta, what was the opportunity cost of producing another unit of manufacturing? So in order to figure that out, let's go back here and recall that we can work out opportunity costs from the slopes of these lines. So starting off with Alberta, we can work out the opportunity cost here as the slope of the line rise over run. And so we get a slope here of 10,000 divided by 2,000. Keep in mind that 10,000 megawatt hours over 2,000 units. 
And that leaves us with a, go cancel out your zeros, 10 divided by two gives us an opportunity cost of five. Okay, five, again, don't forget our units. We have an opportunity cost of five megawatt hours per unit. So again, how do we read this? This is an opportunity cost, but an opportunity cost of what? Is this the opportunity cost of energy or is this the opportunity cost of manufacturing? I'll give you a second to think about that. It's actually a pretty important thing to be able to differentiate which opportunity cost we have just determined here. Okay, to think about this, if it didn't come to you right away, let's think about it in a bit of a different term. And in fact, I'm just gonna quickly scroll down just to give us some room to think about this. Let's say you go to the store and you decide to spend $2 for a cup of coffee. Okay, thinking about this, was this your cost of money or was this your cost of cup of coffee? Well, okay, clearly what this is, this was your cost of a cup of coffee. You had to give up $2 in order to buy a cup of coffee. And in this sense here, this is the exact same situation we have going on up here. You had to give up five megawatt hours in order to buy one unit of manufactured goods. So just like in that example down below, this is the cost of a cup of coffee. This is the cost of a unit of manufactured goods. So we have our opportunity cost of manufacturing in Alberta. We could work it out in much the same way to find out the opportunity cost of energy. And instead of going 10,000 divided by 2,000, we'll do it the other way. We'll do 2,000 divided by 10,000. And what we'd have there, 2,000 divided by 10,000 is going to be 0 0.2. And that's gonna be 0.2 units per megawatt hour. So we have the opportunity cost in each case. Jumping over to Ontario, we can do much of the same. We want to first find out what is the opportunity cost of manufacturing. So we're going to figure out the slope of this line. So just to start off with manufacturing, slope of this line, again, rise over run, 5,000 all over 1250. Keeping in mind our units here, that is 5,000 megawatt hours over to 1,250 units. That's gonna give us an opportunity cost of four megawatt hours per unit of manufactured goods. So again, four megawatt hours being given up to create one unit of manufacturing. Working through it the other way, we have 1250 over 5,000, or we have 0 0.25. Oh, that's uh, a little bit funny there. Let's try that again. 0 0.25 uh, units per megawatt hour. Great. So we have all of these opportunity costs, and you're just sitting here going through all this, and you're just a little bit numb in the mind going, great, Keith, we did a whole bunch of math. We solved a whole bunch of stuff. Why did we do this? Well, okay. Again, bringing it back to what we were trying to do. We said that, yes, Alberta has an absolute advantage, but that this use of your scarce resource, this absolute cost of use of your scarce resource, this wasn't really important for trade. We said that these absolute costs were not necessarily important, but rather what was important was these opportunity costs. So that is, let's go back up here and let's redo this diagram, but sorry, not this diagram, this table, but let's update this table to be in terms of opportunity cost rather than absolute cost. So let's do that. Let's scroll down and create a new table just right down over here. Let's get rid of this cup of coffee one. Okay. So in this case, let's just go and make a nice neutral color and we'll take a look at 
Alberta, and we'll take a look at Ontario. We then want to take a look at our costs of production. So we'll take a look at the costs of production of energy. And we're interested in the opportunity cost. So opportunity cost of energy is how many units I give up to produce a megawatt hour. Very similarly, we want to take a look at the cost of manufacturing. And again, this cost is going to be in terms of opportunity costs. So in this case, how many megawatt hours I give up in order to produce an extra unit. So, okay, just to scroll back up, actually, we can even just cheat. We can drag this guy back down so we can look at it. Okay, so we have our absolute costs over here. We're going to take a look at our opportunity costs. So starting off with Alberta. Opportunity cost of energy. Well, opportunity cost of energy, that's units per megawatt hour. That was 0 0.2 units per megawatt hour. Opportunity cost of manufacturing, 5 megawatt hours per unit. So, okay, let's, uh, let's update this. Let's go down. For Alberta, we had 0 0.2 and we had 5. For Ontario, what do we have going on there? Well, starting off, opportunity cost of energy, so units per megawatt hour. We have 0.25 units per megawatt hour. Or for manufacturing, 4 megawatt hours per unit. Okay, let's update that. 0 0.25 and 4. So what was the point of all this? The point of all this was to update our absolute costs into opportunity costs. Because again, one of our principles of economics was that it is the opportunity cost that's the true cost of an item, not necessarily this absolute cost. The other interesting thing that we'll notice, what well, we said up above that Alberta that Alberta had an absolute advantage, that Alberta could produce both energy and manufactured goods absolutely cheaper than Ontario. But if we come down here and take a look at this, we see that it's no longer true in terms of opportunity cost. In fact, if we look at, say, just energy production to start off, we see that, okay, Alberta, they lose 0.2 units, Ontario loses 0.25 units in both cases to produce an additional megawatt hour. That is, in this case here, instead of units per megawatt hour, which might be a little bit abstract, you could think of it temporarily just as dollars per megawatt hour. And very clearly, you're like, oh, Alberta can produce a megawatt hour of electricity cheaper. They only have to give up 0.2 versus 0.25. That is, we would say that Alberta Let's just circle this here. We would say that Alberta has a comparative advantage in energy production. Very similarly, if we jump over to manufacturing, we see that now, well, Alberta has to give up 5 megawatt hours to produce a unit, but Ontario only has to give up 4 megawatt hours to produce a unit. Again, if it helps you to get past the abstraction, to think of it as five and four dollars per unit, that's fine. That's a good tool to use to kind of bring this back closer to what you're used to thinking about. And we see that, okay, in this case here, Ontario has a relatively cheaper cost of production in the fact that they only have to give up four megawatt hours. So what we witnessed, we came from a case where Alberta had an absolute advantage. They were able to do everything cheaper to moving to take a look at our opportunity costs and realizing that each respective region had their own comparative advantage. The comparative advantage being the one industry, the one method of production that they were relatively better at, that they could produce relatively cheaply. And we see in each Alberta, comparative advantage in energy, Ontario, comparative advantage in manufacturing. Next, what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at these comparative advantages. We're going to talk about prices that we could trade at, 
and we're going to take a look at how we could all be better off by having trade. Let's take a look at that next. In order to witness the benefits or the gains from trade, one of the first things we have to realize is that it makes most sense for each region to specialize in the area of production which they are relatively best at. That is to specialize in the area of production which they have the comparative advantage. So in our case of Alberta here, it would make sense for them to specialize in energy production. To specialize in energy production because they can do it relatively better, relatively cheaper than Ontario can. Similarly, what Ontario should do, Ontario should specialize in manufacturing production. They should be making units of manufactured goods and they should be selling these units of manufactured goods to Alberta. And again, their rationale for doing so is because they're relatively better at producing these units. So from here, once we realize, okay, where each one should specialize, which each, where each one should focus its production efforts on, we can take a look at our next steps forward. And our next steps forward here, here we have just our same opportunity cost brought forward from above. We have our absolute costs, just for reference, and then we have our production possibility frontier for each province just displayed here. This is the same as we looked at in the last little bit. I've just gotten rid of the opportunity costs that were out front here clogging up the diagram. What we want to take a look at then is we want to put each region into a production point at where they're best. So starting off with Alberta, let's use, oh, let's use red for Alberta. We said that Alberta should focus on energy production. So given this case, wherever they may have been before, right, they may have been initially, ah, just to give it some context, maybe they were at some point like this, maybe this is 5,000 megawatt hours of energy and 1,000 units of manufactured goods. This would have been their pre-trade point. Keeping in mind that without trade, if it was just Alberta, they would produce at this point and they would have to consume at this point. I'll just let that sink in for a minute. Without trade, your production and your consumption must be the same. Think about it, again, trade is trade, so think about it if we were talking about just your own life. If you were making heat and food, so heat to keep you warm and food to eat, well, the amount of heat you produce and the amount of food you make would only be equal to the amount that you need to consume. You wouldn't be wasting your effort over producing heat, over producing food, if you didn't need it. So in a case without trade, production and consumption is one and the same and we could imagine it was right here in the middle at 5,000, 1,000. But with trade, with Alberta deciding to specialize in energy production, they are now going to shift all the way out to this point here. Right, so initially they were here and they shifted out to here. That is, they decided to increase their production of energy, how many megawatt hours they produce, but that means that they released all of these manufactured goods. They gave up this production. They released all of these workers into the energy sector. And now they're making all energy. Ontario, Ontario similarly, we could make up the same kind of story we could say that maybe Ontario was similarly consuming somewhere in the middle here at this point. It doesn't have to be this point. It's just kind of make the point that without trade, consumption and production are one and the same. But we're saying that Ontario, Ontario has a comparative advantage in manufacturing. So they shift all of their resources into producing manufacturing right to this extreme here. Okay, so from their perspective, they are increasing their manufacturing sector and they are decreasing or contracting their energy sector. So again, all of the workers that were in this energy sector are being released, laid off, and they're transitioning into this manufacturing sector in order to move along the production possibility frontier to our new, out, 
our new outcome. Okay, so we're now in each of these extreme cases, specializing entirely with what we're best at. What we now need to work out is at which rate we trade at, and if in fact we're better off having trade. So let's take a look at this in terms of cost of manufacturing. And I wanna take a look at this in terms of cost of manufacturing, because our costs, our opportunity costs of manufacturing are whole numbers. So mentally, this is just easier to visualize. Right now, Ontario, Ontario had a cost, that is the cost that it makes them, or sorry, the cost that it costs them to produce a unit of manufacturing is four megawatt hours per unit. Similarly, over here in Alberta's case, they're producing entirely energy, but if they were to switch, if they were to decide to produce more manufacturing, they would have to give up five megawatt hours, five megawatt hours in order to produce that additional unit of manufactured. What we hopefully see with this is that we have room for gains from trade. There is a cost for Alberta to do it themselves of five megawatt hours, and there's a cost for Ontario to produce it of four megawatt hours. There's room here to negotiate a price such that both regions are actually better off and both regions are gaining from trade. To give an example, let's suppose that we decide to trade at, and this is just entirely me picking a number in the middle. Let's suppose we decide to trade at 4.5 megawatt hours per unit. So at this trade rate, 4.5 megawatt hours per unit, again, if it helps you to think about this, think about this as $4.5 per unit, Ontario has a cost of production of four megawatt hours per unit or $4 per unit. Would it then make sense with a cost of $4 per unit to sell at $4.5 per unit? Yeah, in that case there with us just substituting dollars in for megawatt hours, Ontario is able to make 50 cents, $0.5 on every unit they sell. Or similarly, since we're not talking about dollars, we're talking about megawatt hours, they're able to make 0.5 megawatt hours on every unit of manufacturing they sell. They're much better off in this case. Alberta, on the other hand, well, would they be willing to buy manufactured goods at this trade price? Well, okay, Alberta, they're capable of doing it themselves, right? They can make manufactured goods on their own just fine. Question is, is it better to buy it from Ontario. Well, for Alberta to do it themselves, it's gonna cost them five megawatt hours per unit, that's five dollars per unit, versus it would cost to buy it from Ontario 4.5 megawatt hours, dollars per unit. That is again, it's gonna be cheaper for Alberta to buy it from Ontario than for them to produce it themselves. Alberta can save again 0.5 dollars or megawatt hours by buying it from Ontario versus doing it themselves. Okay, I just really want to make this clear. I have substituted in this word dollars quite a few times for megawatt hours as we went through. At no point do we have dollars or money anywhere in this question. That there, that whole concept of saying five dollars per unit instead of five megawatt hours per unit was just to make it more contextually easier to realize or to grasp. We are not dealing with dollars. We're not dealing with currency in this case. We are dealing with a rate of trade-off between two different methods or two different goods that we are producing. So just to really make sure that you're clear on that and no one's lost as to where that dollars came in from. Okay, how do we now show this new trade point? Well, let's take a look. Starting off with Alberta. Right now, their rate of trade-off 
as they give up energy to get manufactured goods is at a rate of five megawatt hours per unit. But if instead of doing it themselves, they trade, well, our rate is gonna be 4.5. So if we think about this, five versus 4.5, starting from our production point here, a slope of 4.5 is significantly shallower. Well, maybe not significantly shallower, but 4.5 is a shallower slope than five. That is our trade line, our trade possibilities frontier would expand out as something like this. And that would be with a cost of 4.5 megawatt hours per unit. Similarly, over from Ontario, Ontario starting at their production decision of entirely manufactured units. Well, they have a cost of four megawatt hours per unit, but we're trading at 4.5. In this case, 4.5 is steeper. So from starting here, we would be expanding with a steeper trade possibilities frontier. And again, that would have a 4.5 megawatt hour per unit cost of trade. Okay, so initially, initially each region, Alberta was stuck producing and consuming right here. Again, we just made up this point. We just said, sure, let's pick somewhere in the middle. This is where Alberta was both producing and consuming without trade. As we liberalized to trade, we produced only energy. So we specialized with what we were best at. But now by specializing, putting all of our efforts into producing energy, we can now buy along this yellow line. That is, if we wanted to, we could actually buy somewhere out here such that at this point it gives us more megawatt hours than we had without trade and more units of manufacturing than we had without trade so by specializing in what we're best at we can then buy the stuff that we're not good at producing for cheaper than we could do it ourselves and we could end up overall better off than we initially were having higher levels of consumption Similarly, we can see the same thing in Ontario, right? This isn't zero sum. This isn't just one country wins, one country loses, or in this case, one province wins, one province loses. In Ontario, they could similarly choose to come out here on their trade line. So again, they're producing, they're only producing manufactured goods, but they can consume along our yellow trade line. And in this case, they can increase their manufactured consumption and increase their energy consumption relative to their initial case. And again, this is because they get to produce the good they're relatively good at, the one that they can produce relatively cheaply. They can sell it for more money, or in this case, more megawatt hours, and they can use that to end up at a higher consumption level. This here, this is our gains from trade. Okay, let's take a second here and talk about this price. So in our case here, what did we have? In terms of exports and imports, when we were talking about manufactured goods, we had Alberta and we had Ontario. Well, manufactured goods, we said, Ontario produced manufactured goods. So that means Ontario is an exporter. They are exporting, selling manufactured goods. And Alberta, Alberta then is our importer. They will import manufactured goods. They're the buyer, right? They're buying these goods. In terms of energy, well, in terms of energy, we're gonna have the opposite. In this case, we said Alberta was producing energy. So Alberta would be the exporter. 
And if Alberta is selling energy, that's because Ontario is buying it. Ontario would be the importer of energy. In this case here, our exporter, so let me just go, exporter is our seller, and our importer is our buyer. In each case, the seller and the buyer is gonna have a maximum and a minimum price that they are willing to pay or willing to accept for this good. If we keep talking about uh, manufacturing, let's take a look at that. Let's talk about what we will just uh, do a shorthand abbreviation as to our maximum willingness to pay. And again, this will be for a unit versus our minimum willingness to accept for a unit. So in each case here, maximum willingness to pay, this would be the buyer, this would be the highest price that I would be willing to pay in order to buy a unit of manufactured goods. Minimum willingness to accept, this is for the seller, this is the lowest price that they'd be willing to accept in order to give up a unit. In each case, we can work out what that's going to be. And let's start off with this maximum willingness to pay. So keep in, again, uh, keep in mind again, this is the maximum willingness to pay how many megawatt hours they'd be willing to pay in order to buy one unit of manufacturing. Who's our buyer? Our buyer of manufacturing is Alberta. So let's take a look at Alberta. Here, we have Alberta with a cost of production of five megawatt hours per unit. That is, this is the cost for Alberta to make a unit of manufactured goods. In this sense here, it would make sense that Alberta's maximum willingness to pay would be the cost of them doing it themselves. At this point, if Ontario were to say, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll sell you manufactured goods, but we're gonna sell them for five megawatt hours per unit. Well, at that point, Alberta's indifferent. They're not necessarily happy, but they're indifferent between buying it from Ontario or producing it themselves. It's the same cost, right? So in that sense, there's no preference towards one or the other. So we can update this and we can say that, okay, for Alberta, the maximum price that they'd be willing to pay for a unit of manufacturing would be five megawatt hours. Similarly, we can go and take a look for minimum willingness to accept. So Ontario being the seller, Ontario being the exporter, what is the lowest price that they would accept to sell a unit? Well, in this case here, their cost of production is four megawatt hours per unit. If they ever accepted less than four megawatt hours per unit, well, that'd be rather silly on their part. They would be better off just to produce energy on their own rather than to accept less than this for a unit. So very similarly, while Alberta's opportunity cost became their maximum willingness to pay, Ontario's opportunity cost will become their minimum willingness to accept. And we have a discrepancy then between the two we have this room in between four and five, such that any value in between here allows both parties to be better off and allows gains from trade to happen. So that is, if we wanted to formalize this, if we ever said, suggest a price in which these two parties could trade at, we could say that the price for Manufacturing is going to be somewhere between four and five megawatt hours per unit. That is where this price ends up 
ah, that's not part of this course. We're not going to get into possible kind of things of that. Really what we're going to work out is just to kind of create this range of possible prices that may exist. And we can realize that any price above four or below five gives us a situation where both parties are better off. If ever I were to ask you to suggest a price, well, you could suggest any number between these two. You could suggest 4.5 as we did here. You could suggest anything else. You could suggest 4.1. You could suggest 4.8, right? It is in between this range here. It is an acceptable range for our gains from trade. 5.2, that would not be an acceptable price. We would not be gaining from trade in this case, and we would just rather produce it ourselves rather than trading with our trading partners. What we could similarly work out, instead of working out what is the trade price for a unit of manufacturing, we could work out, same idea, trade price for a, or at least potential trade price for a, an additional megawatt hour of electricity. Same process going on here where we had our minimum willingness to accept and our maximum willingness to pay. We would similarly have minimum willingness to accept and maximum willingness to pay and a trade price being any point in between these two values. So very much the same thing, just on the other side with our other good. One last thing you might have noticed, if we didn't have to draw these production possibility frontiers, if we didn't have to go through this whole bit of visualizing it, we could have cheated, we could have jumped straight to these opportunity costs from our absolute cost diagram. And let's take a look at what I'm looking at here. If I go 0.5 divided by 0.1, well, 0.5 divided by 0.1, that gives me 5. If we follow our units in this case, that would actually give me five megawatt hours per unit. That is my opportunity cost for Alberta for manufacturing. If I were to do 0.1 divided by 0.5, I'd get 0.2. And again, if you were to follow through how the units work through and cancel each other out, we would end up with 0.2 units per megawatt hour. The opportunity cost for energy production in Alberta. So another way, if we just are looking for opportunity costs, the opportunity cost can be obtained straight from this absolute cost diagram or a table as well. Okay, if we take a look at another example, we see that sometimes we have a PPF provided in two ways. Sometimes we have the actual PPF itself. So in this case here, we have a scarce resource of time. We have Joe, we have Bob, maybe these guys are both uh, stranded on an island. Our story then in this case, right? They need wood for heat and shelter, or they need fish for sustenance for food. Each day they need to collect a bit of both. If they each go alone, well, Joe, given the one day of scarce resource, time, Joe has to make choices between collecting 10 fish, that is devoting all of his day to fish, or collecting 15 wood if the entire day was collect, uh, devoted towards wood. Very similarly, Bob has the same kind of trade-offs. Bob can pick, uh, collect five fish each day if he devotes the whole day to that, or Bob can devote uh, the whole day to collecting wood and similarly collect five bundles of wood. Sometimes you'll see it just strictly this table in the above being provided to you. Let's, uh, let's just uh, differentiate that there. There we go, uh, right there, that blue line up. Sometimes in a question, you will only get this table provided to you. Meanwhile, sometimes in a question, you will only get the production possibility frontier provided to you. Both of these, you should be able to utilize just fine in order to solve the problem. In both cases, we have the same steps as to how to approach this. We have the same steps as to what we need to do. We just have a slightly different starting point. Uh, typically, a lot of people I find when you start with the table, they actually really like to get from the table to the diagram. And in fact, I'm one of these people as well. A bit of a visual learner, a bit of a visual problem solver. Table, great, with a lot of experience. Sure, I can work through this and figure it out straight from the table, but I typically like to take this, draw a production possibility frontier, 
so that I can be sure as to what's happening, so I can actually visualize what's happening. This question, ultimately, I'm going to leave for you guys to work out. Um, some kind of steps to work through it are, first, determine the opportunity cost for each agent for each good. Keep in mind, one of the big things with opportunity cost, if I were to tell you that it's going to cost you $2 per cup of coffee, what is this the cost of? Is this the cost of dollars or is this the cost of a cup of coffee? Well, hopefully you're like, yeah, yeah, Keith, that's the cost of a cup of coffee. Well, very similarly, if we go back up here, I'm not going to look at the numbers, so I'm just going to make this up. This probably is not an opportunity cost. If I had an opportunity cost of two fish per wood, right? Well, in the same way that this $2 per cup was the cost of a cup of coffee, this two fish per wood is the cost of a bundle of wood. It's going to give up two fish in order to get one wood. So again, just that quick reminder as to how opportunity costs work. The denominator there is what we are measuring the cost of. Once you have these uh, opportunity costs for each agent and good determined, figure out who is the comparative advantage. Keep in mind the comparative advantage is who can produce each good the cheapest. Right, so who has the cheapest cost of production? Once you have that, well, you know, hey, the cheaper one, they're going to be the producer, the exporter. Well, for the exporter, the producer, figure out what their minimum willingness to accept is. What's the lowest price they will accept in order to sell that good? And on the other side, the other one will be the importer, the consumer. And so for them, determine what their maximum willingness to pay is. What's the highest price they'd pay to get this good? Once you have these two extremes, you can determine a trade price. And again, that trade price is just going to fall in between these minimum willingness to accept and this maximum willingness to pay. And from that trade price, you can just put it in as the appropriate slope, right? Again, I'm just going to kind of freehand this to show you again how it looks. Let's presume, again, I'm not even working through this problem. Don't take this as part of the answer. It might be, it might not be. I'm just going to presume that Joe produces wood and say we have a trade line. The trade line will typically sit like this, right? So again, just showing that as the other quick example, I don't know if Joe produces wood. I have not worked through the opportunity costs, but if Joe were to produce wood, we would specialize in that case there. And then we would have a trade line such that I could sell it for a higher price than it would cost me to switch on. If you have any questions with this problem, uh, check the frequently asked questions. There should be a solution posted there uh, as well. Reach out to me, email, or through that frequently asked questions board as well. Until next time.